So this project centers around Holy Trinity Church, now renamed the Cloudsley Center. Um, it was completed in 1829 and designed by Sir Charles Barry, who um, as a young architect, and he then went on to design the Houses of Parliament. Um, and is therefore quite a celebrated architect. The building is grade two star listed and currently on the Historic England Heritage at Risk Register category A, meaning it's in really very poor condition. Um, we suffered, for example, from a lightning strike on one of the turrets, which means that it will need to be taken down and rebuilt. Both our roofs were in danger of collapse. Um, and internally, the nave ceiling was in danger of collapse. So all in all, um, it's a building that, that needs a lot of love and attention. We um, have been funded by the Architectural Heritage Fund to do a feasibility study to look as to how we might reuse the building. And the costs indicated at that time that we would require in the region of 7 million to uh, totally refurbish the building for new uses. Um, we are currently undertaking urgent repairs to the North Isle roof, having recently completed the South roof, and this has been funded with emergency funding, well, repair funding from Historic England, and that has been extremely helpful uh, in helping us uh, stave off the poor condition of the building. So uh, here's a photograph um, internally with one of our volunteers down through the nave to the east end and on the right we've got a picture an exterior picture of the west end before the scaffolding was erected and here's another internal picture and you can see sadly the condition of um, the nave ceiling which is netted just in case um, any pieces of plaster become loose um, so the Tales from the Crypt project has been pulled together by a number of um, people. Kevin Rogers, obviously the client and um, owner, pushed forward this project. He is head of Paris Building. And then um, he pulled together a team of Rebecca, um, Susan, myself, Laura, um, and Anna and Nia and Chris. And between us, we have taken the roles of volunteer coordinator, project manager. Um, Laura came in from art and Christianity and her role was to secure the artists who undertook um, art workshops for the primary school pupils at New River College. And Chris has come on board as a volunteer and as our designer. So, um, our key partners for this project were Islington Guided Walks, who have been leading um, guided walks around the area. And Susan Han is talking to us later today about how that was developed. We've worked with the Islington Society, putting on a number of evening talks um, and Islington Museum and History Centre. And the exhibition was originally meant to be held in the museum, but had to be closed from COVID um, and is now actually being held in the south aisle of the Cloudsley Centre, which again sadly will have to close due to the next lockdown. Um, and our final partner was New River College, the primary school, and they are just off Cloudsley Square. And the whole the whole point about talking about the team here is that between us, we pulled together a project based around who our known partners were, who potential partners were, and what we could do to generate um, genuine interest in the project. And the Tales from the Crypt project itself is based around the history of the building and also the history of the people uh, who were buried in the crypt up until 1854. Um, and there are a known number of people buried in the crypt of 178, but we are not quite sure how many coffins remain at the moment, but it is a good significant number. Um, and that is the whole premise of the, of the project. And uh, the aim was to build genuine links with the local community. It was funded by the Heritage Fund, 
um, who was our primary funder, which was fantastic. And it was also funded um, by the Mayor of London Culture Seeds funding and um, some match funding from the diocese itself. So in terms of what the project actually achieved, um, Rebecca researched the history of the building and that is on the LDF website for people to be interested. We have managed to secure over 25 volunteers to research the history of the people buried in the crypt. We've developed a guided walk. Um, it is one walk that we developed because we had to tweak for COVID. Um, we are holding three public talks. This is the third of the legacy workshops. We also secured slightly under 10 volunteers to help curate the exhibition. And we worked with over 20 pupils from New River College uh, in art workshops in September last year. The pull-up banners have been uh, removed from the project due to difficulties in taking them around the Islington museums and not, le sorry, Islington libraries and not least because a number are shut. So sadly, because of COVID, we have had to rejig the project a little bit. Um, but I think in essence, we've managed to achieve pretty much what we set out to achieve. So these are some of the outcomes that um, we have and are delivering um, as per the HLF requirements. Um, I won't read through them, but you can <clears throat> pick them up a little bit later, but you know, principally, the most important thing is that we've trained volunteers, um, we've worked with young people and we've made genuine links in the local community that will stand us in really good stead for working with the community again um, to try and save the building. So here are a number of our volunteers, basically um, learning about the history of the area and talking about some of these stories that they had unearthed as part of their research. And here's a picture of one of the pupils from New River College, um, working with the artists based on the history of the building. So just to finalize, um, in terms of pulling a project of this nature together, we spent three months consulting with the wider community and we then uh, submitted a project inquiry to the Heritage Fund. Um, once we received approval to submit an application, it took a further two to three months to develop that application, and then six weeks to receive a decision and an award letter. Then took a further two months to secure permission to start because we were um, looking at securing match funding. And in total, we then said we would have an 18 month delivery program, but Due to the second COVID lockdown, it is looking like that may need to be extended. Um, and here you can see our total project costs were 58,000, the majority being funded by the Heritage Fund. So this is a significant grant for us and has made um, a big contribution to the project. So that's an introduction um, to the project. Does anybody have any questions if you haven't heard that before as to what we were trying to achieve, what we were trying to do, anything I haven't explained? Oh, yeah, there's one from Hazel. Yes, Hazel. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wonder whether in one of your um, slides you could give us a breakdown of how the budget was spent, just so that we get an idea of the ratio between, say, the project management cost versus yes. the art costs. Obviously not to the extent of confidential information, but just to give us the, the, the sort of broad, yeah. yeah. Um, well, yes, I mean, the art costs took about, um what did they take about 15 15 to 20 percent of the budget um maybe a little bit less 15 percent i would say of the budget um we had to pay 
for consultants time, for example, for researching the building, um, for Susan's time in coordinating the volunteers. Um, we put a reasonable percentage of money in for equipment and materials. So we needed to obviously um, print off all the storyboards for the exhibition. Um, we had, uh, we printed a whole lot of leaflets that we were going to send out um, uh, in March, you know, uh, which obviously never got used. Um, we've included, um, which is important, some funding for volunteers, um, uh, volunteers expenses, travel expenses, consultants expenses. Um, we had included some time for the um, workshop venues because originally we were going to go to different churches around London, um, but again, obviously that had to be cancelled. So um, we've gone on Zoom instead. Um, and we put in a 5% contingency into the budget and that's extremely important um, because there are always things that you forget to put in and projects always change as they develop. Um, so it's important just to have a small pool of funding that you can draw on if need be. Um, so I think, and the other thing is that although COVID has a, increased our time and therefore our costs, we have had cost savings because for example, we haven't had to pay for venues. We haven't had to pay for catering, giving everybody coffee and biscuits. Um, you know, so there are various savings we've made, which has meant that we've managed to tweak it without needing any further funding, which has been really useful. Um, so does that help? I mean, I, I think in terms of the artist workshops, it is quite tricky to work out how to, um, to budget at, not least because, again, we had to change how we went about that um, from our initial discussions to the actual practicalities of it, because uh, New River College is a pupil referral unit. So it's a very small um, school and a number of the children don't attend school every day for various reasons. So the numbers change and we had to then rejig the number of workshops that we were going to do. But in the end, it meant that we reached every single pupil in that school which was brilliant, which I don't think we had originally anticipated. So, you know, there were lots of benefits from changing, but again, um, yeah, projects, projects do merge and you, you do need to have some flexibility within the budget to be able to deal with that. Does that help? Or would you like me to go through it and give you a kind of breakdown percentage later, which I can do? Uh, yeah, if you could do, the more detailed later, uh, mm -hmm. including whether your costs were being borne by the diocese or whether they were charged to the budget. As I say, I don't want to get into detail. No, no, it's fine. Well, what I'll do is I'll do it. I'll do it on a percentage breakdown. So that's fine. Yeah, um, like you can Thank still you. work it out anyway. But the point is, everybody's project costs were included in the grant application. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I see we've had some. Yeah, there's a few mm -hmm. on there. Um, some of them might want to be referred to some of the earlier presentations um, that we've done. Um, so, um, Rosie, I've... three months consulting the wider community. You said on that sort of timeline. How did how did that happen? How did you do that? So, basically, um, we had a number of conversations with, for example, um, uh, the theatre. Um, I mean, we, we basically went to key organisations in the community. So we went to the school, we went to the theatre, um, we went to a number of organisations and some said yes, they would be really interested in participating and others said no, they wouldn't. And that's why it takes three months because you need to have enough time pinging ideas backwards and forwards as to does this fit with the project and our ideas um, or not? Or does somebody have a better idea that means we need to change our project ideas? Um, basically, it's just a case of 
picking up the phone or dropping them an email and then starting to have the conversations. Um, most people are just pleased that you thought of them. Mm. Um, there so, was also, sorry, Susan, Rosie, yeah. Sorry, Susan, do you want to, the, the question about did we connect with the families of the primary school pupils? Um, what do you think to that? Well, I would say um, we didn't personally, as it were, it was through the, um, it was very much the workshops were aimed at the children, the pupils at the school, um, but the, the, the culmination of the um, a term's work of workshops was uh, an exhibition in the school where families and carers could come along and um, I think we had about 50 or so people there and that was a really lovely event where the children could be there present and tell their, 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 their families about the exhibition and obviously we took soundings, we chatted to the families then but it wasn't a formal integration of them in the project. Um, I think that's something that uh, looking forward that would be lovely to do and work on going forward but um, mm -hmm. it, uh, throughout all this this is quite a tightly conceived project so therefore it was sort of like the, the base for something, um, a springboard for the next stage for the for the building as Rosie's outlined. So that's something we definitely want to develop. Okay, and then we've got one final question, which is more images and details. So that was covered very much under workshop two. So um, if anybody wants to know more about the art workshops side of this project, then go on to the Diocese of London website um, through the link that Rebecca will send you, uh, Becky Payne will send, and um, uh, you'll be able to see the recording of workshop two and all the individual presentations. So hopefully that would give you a good idea as to what was achieved. Um, I think that's all the questions on my presentation. So I'm quite keen to move yeah. on to Susan, uh, who's going to talk to us about interpreting uh, heritage. Susan um, is a historian and has worked on the project with us. Um, and uh, she was the volunteer coordinator for the project. So she's been very closely involved in working um, with the local community. Lovely. Good morning, everyone. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen. Um, Okay, are we all right? Can we see that? Okay, lovely. Well, um, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you all um, this morning and uh, lovely to see some familiar faces in the audience from the previous two workshops. Um, so far we've discussed um, how I helped um, guide the volunteers, research volunteers through the process of researching the tales from the crypt uh, worked with the artists um, in developing the themes for their workshops, which was in the workshop two. And now we're moving on to interpretation um, and the creation of the Tales from the Crypt exhibition, which as Rosie has already um, made clear, actually uh, had two iterations. And I'm sorry, this is always going to be quite a confusing thing. Um, in my later presentation, you'll see some slides from each of the exhibitions as if you were actually touring the exhibition. Because one of the things we wanted to do in this workshop was have you on site in Islington Museum. We could take you upstairs, let you have a wander around and you could tell us what you think about the exhibition. So we can't do that. Instead, we'll have to um, do it virtually. Um, and that's actually quite an important segment of what I'm going to say is because interpreting heritage, I could speak for hours on the different forms and I don't hope to be comprehensive, but it just shows that this project shows that our original intentions of how we would share the interpretation have had to change because of the COVID um, pandemic. And first of all, I should disclaim, I am a historian, not an interpretation expert. We'll have the experts on along later. So apologies, this is very much 
um, my perspective uh, from the point of view of the volunteer coordinator. But I'm going to have a stab at what is heritage interpretation. Um, a former uh, a professional, in my former professional life, I worked in uh, English heritage as well as a blue plaques historian. So that seems a very uh, prominent symbol of what interpretation is, heritage interpretation. And we like to think that that was one of the earliest forms um, outside the gallery and the museum. Uh, it's it, as, as the scheme dates back to the 1860s. Um, and then I've also got two images of a more traditional heritage site, Apple Durkham House in the Isle of Wight. One with an empty interior, and there's a signboard right at the end, quite a, um, a, a low key approach to interpretation. And on the right, I'm afraid shamelessly using my family, um, where they're doing a bit of self interpretation. And uh, my other half's actually introducing my son to the joys of Peverson as architectural guides and looking at the building themselves. So that's quite hardcore, especially for an 11 year old, but he enjoyed it, I tell you that. Um, and then on the left, the images of, I think, a very poignant bit of interpretation, which Islington Council um, and Museum and uh, Islington Heritage arranged for the centenary of the First World War, which is um, these signs that are attached um, by the street signs across the borough, commemorating the people who lived in those streets and lost their lives in the First World War. It is quite a grubby little sign. Um, it could do with a bit of a wipe, but there are lots of hundreds of them around the borough. And I think they're a fantastic form of interpretation. And I think what this side demonstrates is that you can have the very um, high level interpretation that possibly um, an English heritage or National Trust site uh, provides down to the lowliest thing of really a laminated sheet of A4. It's all a form of interpretation. So what are the benefits of heritage interpretation? Because I think it's worth thinking about it before we dive into devising an exhibition or a, a suite of interpretive panels. And here I've shamelessly cribbed from the experts, the Association for Heritage Interpretation, because I really liked the succinctness with which they, they believe that interpretation enriches our lives. So through engaging emotions, enhancing experiences, and deepening understanding of places, people, events and objects from the past and present. Now, as a historian, I have to say, if I'd been asked that question, I would have said it's about sharing learning and understanding, it's about sharing the outcomes of research. I would have that as my primary. But anyone who understands about how people learn, how people engage, will, will know that it's more than just presenting somebody with some text, some images, letting them get on with it. You have to engage people, you have to engage the emotions, and you have to enhance the experience of, of learning. Otherwise, and we've all, I'm sure we have all done it, going around an exhibition, you read the label, forget it a minute later, but you remember the painting. That's how I work, I'm afraid. Um, and on the right here, I've, I've got a, a very, um, I think a very lovely image of uh, St. Michael's Church in Camden Town, where they had a very simple and perhaps conventional uh, approach to interpretation by installing six or seven um, signs, freestanding signs in the aisles of the church. Um, but what I love is the fact that the, the candles are right by them. So the sort of the mission of the church is right by the interpretation and the two overlap. And what's interesting about how they came to devise them, they made sure that one of the signs was about the current life of the church. Um, and I think that's the thing with the, the definition we've got here, it's past and present and remembering to connect those two. Um, so I'm also showing that slide just because the interpretation that we were faced with with Tales from the Crypt project was, and I have to underline this, never going to be within the building itself, the former church building. That has happened because of lockdown. Uh, it was always going to be separate from the, the, the place, uh, the building and the church, and therefore quite unusual in having being having a museum and archive setting. I have no idea what your projects are, but it would be interesting to know whether you are facing similar 
challenges or you perhaps have a more straightforward situation of you want to bring interpretation within the walls of, of a place of worship. So how can heritage inter interpretation help fulfill project objectives? Um, and this is an image of the exhibition as installed in the Clausley Second Centre. Um, and I've just pulled out the um, some of the outcomes that, I mean, Rosie's shared a few of you, these with you already from the Heritage Fund. Um, but I think this is really helpful to think about when we're doing it. Um, what is your objective in all this? Heritage will be better identified and better explained. People will have learned about heritage. So it's wonderful to have interpretive displays, but if nobody sees them, or very few people see them, have you really achieved your objective? Hopefully a wider range of people will be involved in heritage. Now, from the point of view of uh, most projects, that's also that's as volunteers, but also as visitors to an exhibition uh, or gallery or, or whatever the setting is. Now, this is a tricky one. The local area will be a better place to live, work or visit. And I think had we not had the exhibition in um, the Clousey Centre, that would be a harder one to interrogate because what has been fantastic, and we'll talk about this um, as we go along, is that local people have been able to come into this building for the first time in many years. Um, and therefore it has enhanced their experience of living in the place. It is a building site. It's got a huge conservation deficit as Rosie has outlined. This is the start of something. And then finally, from the point of view of the volunteers, people will have developed skills and uh, 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 sort of achieve greater well-being through the process of creating this exhibition together. As Rosie's made clear, it was always about volunteers um, curating the exhibition. Uh, my role was only to coordinate and guide really, um, together with the curator at uh, Islington Museum, uh, Ros Curry, and then Jane um, uh, briefly as well. So our challenge, and I'm sure you will have your own challenges, how to interpret the history of Holy Trinity Church. So the research done by Rebecca, who will be speaking to us next, and the stories of its earliest community. So the lives of the 178 people buried in the crypt between 1829 and 1864. Just to give you an insight into how, some of the, research, how the research volunteers got close to understanding those lives, uh, they looked into the family histories, they um, located where the people in the crypt had lived in the current in the current streetscape. So here's one of the houses just up the road from the church. And we searched for graves as well. So here's one of our volunteers finding a very buried grave of some of the relatives of people who buried in the crypt as well. And this is in Highgate Cemetery. And one of the ways we shared these stories and learned about them is by actually walking the streets. Um, there are very few memorials to these individuals in the church. It's only a, a, a select few who have memorials in the church. Um, so the best way to share these stories, to, to shed light on them was to actually go and visit where they used to live. And this is our volunteers sharing stories about um, two individuals, one on the left, George Lovejoy, uh, in Clasey Road and then Morven Terrace on the right. Um, we'll, I won't go into detail about the exact stories, details. Um, I covered that in the, the second of the talks which um, I gave, which we gave to Islington Society. So here's the team uh, of volunteer curators. We recruited seven um, people to help us. Um, four of whom were already involved in the project through doing research and three were newcomers. And I just would like to say the value of having some fresh eyes, fresh input, fresh ideas, because I can say this confidently, all of us get too close to our subject. All of us fight high, very hard to see the wood for the trees. And they, the, the, the three uh, new people, Dawn, Phoebe and Alicia brought great clarity, asked brilliant questions of the research volunteers and there was a real dialogue and and that was a huge strength so if it is at all possible bring in some flesh fresh blood they will um really really help um i think hone ideas 
So here's a picture of Ros leaving one of the three workshops that she delivered in autumn 2019. We'll be talking more about that in the later session. Um, and then on the right is uh, our two of our volunteers installing objects in one of the display cabinets. So on the face of it, our research findings, um, Rebecca's were incredibly rich, as you'll be seeing. They were visual, they were, there were maps, there was story, there was a chronology, there was immense amounts of detail. We could tell the story of the church. That was actually the easier bit of the exhibition. How do we turn lots of pages of um, script, of text, very few images, and some photos of buildings into a lively and interesting um, visual exhibition. And here's two of the sort of, <laughs> the data that were shared, two of the pieces of data. There's a summary of the, um, the, the 178 lives, and then there's a more detailed um, sheet on the left about four individuals. So what we did seemed obvious really, as we were collating all the stories, and that's some of the work that I did was to Look at the thing, the factors that jumped out at you, the, the common themes. And I, I'm, I'm a great believer in color coding to understand our way through all this lot of text. So here are our themes that we pulled out um, from the material, from the tales, um, builders and architects, trade and travel, funeral practice and mourning. And these were the issues that we started to debate in those, those three workshops and started to hone. And they would lead to the actual interpretation panels and the selection of objects. And I've just included a little detail from one of the um, images of the church, early images of the church. Essentially what we were trying to do was imagine these characters, these black and white characters, who were they and can we, can we, can we bring life to them? So one example which I'll run through very quickly is the tale of the brothers Goff, Baker and Architect. Um, this family had no fewer than 11 members of the extended family buried in the church. Um, eight of them are children. And what we were quite confused by to begin with is were they related? But one was a well known architect, um, Alexander um, Dick Goff, and the other one was a baker. And were we sure that those two professions could possibly be related? And yes, they were. They were brothers, their fathers buried there. Um, this is on the left is the Baker's Shop, 118 Clousley Road, uh, and John and Harriet Goff lived there. Three of their children were buried in the crypt, as was Harriet, uh, the Baker's um, wife. Um, so blending these stories with images of some of the buildings that Alexander Dick Goff, his brother, um, designed, such as the Almeida Theatre, what's now the Almeida Theatre above, and St Mark's Church and Tonington Park, was a really good way of, of, of conveying the myriad, sort of the diverse nature of these people. So here we are opening up in Islington Museum and local history center. Here are two images of the exhibition in its first version. On the left is downstairs in the museum space and upstairs in Islington local history center. And here we come on to the second version of the exhibition not exactly a museum space, um, but the aisle, one of the aisles of the church, the south aisle of the church. Please note the ceiling, the bright white ceiling, the repairs that lie above that um, were crucial to this happening. As Rosie's explained, emergency repairs were carried out, which made this a usable space, um, which was safe for us to open up to visitors. Um, it was still quite, it is still very much a building site and work in progress. But I think the cluster of um, people there shows that it, we, we did very well in attracting people. Um, and then on the right is just one of our volunteers looking at some of the artwork that the children produced. Obviously the exhibition wasn't the only form of interpretation that this project developed. And I have no wish to stand on um, Susan's toes because she'll be talking about the guided walks, but. The material, the research material and Rebecca's research material on the church was shared with the guided walk um, and they devised their own walking tours. Um, and here's two images of, of them in progress. And there was also a guided walk map, which our designer Chris Wells um, 
designed, which was always to be handed out at the exhibition and on the walks. Now, one of the reasons why it was we felt very important um, when we were devising uh, the interpretation was that because the Islington Museum and Local History Centre are at some distance, a 10 minute walk from the Clousey Centre, we wanted to direct people towards those streets, towards the building. Little did we know when devising this that actually we could hand it out in the building itself. So, but it's a wonderful resource. And also I think this is one of the things that will provide some legacy going forward as well as the interpretive panels, which are now in the building. And that's something I think is really important to build in. Um, obviously things like um, some things you, you can't uh, keep forever. I mean, the, the exhibition in its first form lasted a day and a half and has been was assembled. Hardly anyone saw it. That's a loss, but this is one of the good things that has been sustained throughout the project. So just to sum up, um, I'm talking about really the whole interpretive challenge was to turn the silhouettes of these people, we just have their names, uh, their age at death, where they lived, into fully fledged stories. Um, and here's a lovely view of the exhibition showing the silhouettes which um, the artists took of the children in the um, art workshops, which are welcoming people to the exhibition. Just for those of you who've not been to the Finsbury Library, on this side of the glass is the normal library. So the people using the library are able to see through to the exhibition beyond, and that was supposed to lure people in and to um, encourage them to come and look at an ex exhibition um, about the place. Sadly, that wasn't possible, but hey, we have to be very grateful for the fact that we ended up with the exhibition on display in the Clousey Centre. So I will stop sharing and ask, are there any questions? I think we have a couple that have already come through on the chat. Thanks, Susan. Um, we have... Um, so, uh, in, regarding the volunteers who were researching, did you did they undergo any formal training to carry out um, all the tasks on their own, um, or were they always facilitated? That's a really good question. And um, if you want more chapter on verse of how we did that, um, do have a look at the first workshop where I go into that in some depth. Um, Yes, I did. And my role was to coordinate volunteers, but also to mentor them and support them. Uh, they received formal archival training from um, uh, the archivist at Islington Local History Centre, Julie Melrose, and she um, provided them with an introduction to what was available, what materials were available in the archives, um, where else they could look. Um, obviously, in terms of online resources, uh, Ancestry played a big role in gaining access to that via London Metropolitan Archives. What I found, just to share now, I won't go into great depth, but what I, because time is short, but what I found, um, I learned from this project is very much, people are amazingly resourceful and um, self-starting, but just a little bit of help and guidance in how to navigate uh, online resources for the first time and checking in via email. This is what I've found. I've taken a photo. Can you help me with it? So it's it's being on hand um, and trying to answer questions, but telling them right at the start, I I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Um, so yeah. Um, thanks, Susan. Um, one more question was, um, what was the big idea and the main story behind all of the individual stories? So what I suppose what this person's um, trying to say is what was the main what were you hoping that visitors were going to be taking away um, overall from the interpretation was that was there a, was there a particular um, I, I, I suppose you don't want to direct them into a particular way of thinking but was there a particular story or a particular feeling that you wanted people to take away from um, the overall interpretation Okay, that's a really good question and I, I'm going to come on to that when Jenny and I talk about the exhibition in more detail but just what I would say is connection um, mm -hmm. for present visitors to connect with the past and obviously it has deep resonance because that community those buildings are still there people have been inhabited so local residents could actually come and find out who used to live in their house 
So that's one of the things is connecting. And I think we are very mindful of that because it's a closed church, there is no existing community today, no worshiping community, no congregation. So can we suggest who that community was in the past? Mm -hmm. um, and not only that those people were defined by their um, association with the church, but also their life and their work. So that was the main thing, but I will be coming on to that in more detail later. Okay. Um and just one more point, someone, um, Shanna from the um, oh, from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, just clarifying, when we talk about the Cloudsley Centre, is the, the former church building, as it's now a closed church, um, it was yeah. once known as Holy Trinity. It is now known as the Cloudsley Centre, but it is the former church building. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes, and and that's also because it is is no longer used for worship. So it it's. What we like to think is the start of its new life as the Clousey Centre. Great, um, and I think that's that's all the questions, Rosie. Um, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, so, sorry, let me just... Uh, we are now um, going to have Rebecca speaking about exploring the built heritage and sharing research and interpreting heritage. Um, and this will draw on some of the key points from her presentation in workshop one. And Rebecca uh, is a research historian um, and has been an integral part of this project. So thank you, Rebecca. I'm just looking for my PowerPoint, excuse me. Can you see that? Rosie, can you see the... Oh, uh, sorry, yes, yes, I can see the screen, thank you. Excellent. Um, the PowerPoint isn't up though. Oh. What we've got is... We've just got your um, like your file, your folder. Yes, I don't know why that's come up. Let me... Um... Give me a second, I'm sorry. Perfect. Good. Let me just put that on. Right. Yep. Is that better? Yep. Perfect. You don't want to see my filing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Rosie, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, as Rosie said, my role was to research the building primarily um, in order to understand it better and conserve it, protect it for the future. Um, I'm not going to talk about the process of that today. Um, that was covered in workshop one. But what I'm going to talk about is um, collaboration and sharing research and the layers of interpretation that this can lead to. Um, in other words, the work that I did, how that um, was communicated to um, and enriched the other bits of the project but also how I learned from everyone else working on the project and on the building. So my brief was to investigate um, the documentary and visual archives relating to the church ground and the fabric um, from the choice of the site up to works um, up to the present day. Um, in this case, we found a huge amount of um, documentary evidence, doesn't always happen. <coughs> But um, the architect, Charles Barry, left no drawings. So there was no central archive from the architect. So we had to piece it together from um, a mixture of legal records, building records, and ecclesiastical records. And what I did with all this was to build up what we've called a chronology, which is basically a transcription of everything I found that was written um, of the building and the restoration works, damage and repairs, up to the present day or as near as I could get to that. And I also produced a digital archive, um, just really collated um, word documents and digital files of everything we found in the way of images and maps in order to plot change over, over time um, to the church. 
and to, you know, the Cloudsley Centre now. Um, communication. I mean, some of this you'd expect, it's fairly basic, but I think it's important to say how we communicated ideas, research materials, um, because we were often all working separately. So we had regular meetings, um, which Rosie organised with the central project team, with our partners, and this is in the early days, um, when we just had the grant, um, Islington Heritage and Art and Christianity, and later the artists and with the volunteer coordinator and myself. And we produced monthly research reports, which were often quite short, but sometimes included images of exciting things we found or things that were to flag up that we wanted to look at um, further. And then we had sort of more informal communications um, by email, telephone, occasional meetings. And that's with Kevin Rogers, who as Rosie said, is head of parish property support for the Diocese of London um, with Rosie herself. And also um, I was in contact fairly frequently with Edwin Holland, uh, Edward Holland, the architect who prepared, prepared the conservation management plan quite early on in the process, um, sort of just as I was getting going. So that was really useful for me. And Susan and I um, had lots of meetings and, and talking. Now, um, research can be fairly solitary, research and writing, but Susan and I made sure we had um, lots of research trips where we either worked side by side or sometimes we handled documents together. And um, this is great fun, but it's also, um, as Susan said, two heads are always better than one. So we looked at documents together. Obviously we couldn't do that now, but if we were able to photograph the documents, we could sort of talk about them and share them that way. Uh, these are vestry minutes from um, London Metropolitan Archives, and they bear, usually bear um, patient scrutiny. Very fruitful for the stories um, for the exhibition, as, uh, as well as for understanding the building. And we did the same at Islington Local Studies, um, just going through boxes and boxes um, of materials that, again, told us about the church, but also the wider picture, who lived there and what was going on. We also learned from experts. This is Kevin Rogers again, and this was a really early um, event with these are members of um, Islington, um, the Islington Society here, being told about the building in it or outside it by someone who really understands the fabric is just invaluable. And I was really pleased that that happened quite early on in the project before I went delving into the archives. And the experts were also in the local um, studies library and at the museum. And this is Julie Melrose at one of the training sessions that Su Susan mentioned, uh, which we obviously attended too. And, you know, these people really know the area. They very likely know your church too. So I learned huge amounts here and we were lucky enough to go into the stacks. Well, Susan and I also did a walk and talk with pupils from, um, in two sessions um, from the school. And that obviously was tricky because of the state of the building and children, you know, it's like herding cats with primary school children. But it was really useful to be able to pitch our histories at something that a primary school child would understand. And their responses actually were um, really interesting about what they thought its future might be, what they would do with it, how much it might cost. So that was all quite eye-opening, I found. I also learned huge amounts from, from the volunteers, just walking the streets, um, learning from the built environment, um, you know, hugely valuable, really interesting. So what did all, um, what I did amount to, and this is um, the first couple of pages of the, the bulk of what I did, and it's really just bunging it all in a Word document so that it can then be shared by um, the various other parties, as Susan said, including the walks, the curators, um, and also the people working on the building, the people that um, are going to make it safe and protect it for the future. So this is just a short introduction, um, followed by 
transcriptions of records. So it's fairly dry, it's rather long, but you can word search it. So you could plot say when the organ moved or um, major repairs. Um, and then documents showing um, maps and the visual record. Um, change over time again. And all images that we could find of the interior and the exterior. And this is after uh, reordering in the early 20th century. And aerial evidence and photography. And we can see, for example, here that the pinnacle's just been restored, which tallies with the documentary evidence. Now, I put this in to show that documentary research is all very well, but we have to match that against what actually happened in the building. Um, very often church records are records that show you what has been permitted to do, doesn't always tell you that they were carried out um, as planned or at all. I also put it in to show um, that the research was going on alongside works to the building. So this happened to come in 2019 from Rosie could I find anything to say um, what these works, why they were done in 1960s and 70s um, and what the materials used might be. So, um, so this is about collaboration. And what it, so it wasn't as if I prepared a document and handed it over, it was being done alongside um, works to the church. And I put this rather, you know, not that exciting picture of the church, but this little square here indicated that it was likely to be the entrance to the crypt. Um, and so it proved, um, so people could go on site, investigate where it was and make sure that nobody put the scaffolding up on that spot. Similarly, these um, drawings, um, these are from the faculty for works, the major works, um, in 1912, um, showed a different configuration of the narthex and lobby area to how it is at present. Um, and beyond the scope of what I can do, paint analysis then concurred with the drawn out evidence. Um, the paint layers on the screen differ from the other joinery until the last three decorate redecorations, uh, meaning the screen came later. Um, and this is the conservation management plan. Um, prepared by Edward Holland. He shared his findings with me and um, in turn I did the same with him. As Susan said, the chronology also fed into the timeline um, prepared by the volunteers and designed by Chris Wells. And I can now see that I should actually have had very similar bullet points at the top of um, my chronology just to give people almost instant access to the major changes. And actually, I think I should revise that. Um, so what I produce through the research is just one level of the interpretation, but then it's um, reinterpreted multiply by others. Last, but no, by no means least, we shared the research with you through the workshops. And the questions and feedback have been really useful um, to me in thinking about how we go about communicating the research process and sharing the outcomes. Um, and as in the previous slide, um, we also gave talks to the Islington Society um, and the next one is going to be delivered by Rosie Fraser and Laura Moffat. So to sum up, um, I hope to have given you uh, an inkling of how fruitful collaborative research can be to understanding heritage, that's the building, the research and the stories associated with it. And this is crucial to our understanding of the grade two star listed building and to understanding its significance. And that's socially as well as architecturally. And I also think that sharing this learning and research adds to the overall effectiveness of the project, including the outcomes um, produced in collaboration with the local community and further afield. I think that's it. Are there any questions? Rebecca, do you want to unshare? Brilliant, thank you.
we don't have any in the chat unless there are any more. I can't see any. I can't see any. Re You've given them everything that they need to know, Rebecca. It's really good. They are really sainted. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Hannah, are there any unanswered questions? Because I saw about how do you know what your community? Yeah, is? that was one I I um, wanted to come back to. Um, that's the only one that I think got missed. Uh, yes. So can you give us a rough idea of who your local community are? Um, well, gosh, they're everybody really. So um, they are obviously local residents, people who live there. They are your um, local community groups. So um, there'll be a number of groups and charities that will work in your area. Um, there will be local businesses. There will be um, leisures, for example, the Almeida Theatre. I mean, it's, it's literally anybody who is, lives or works within a geographic zone. Um, and um, finally, obviously, the local schools. So, you know, it's just really important to go out and reach out to everybody. And the good thing about um, social media is that it helps you reach people um, more easily, I think, than perhaps in the past where it might have been a little bit more drier um, call for information. There is one more question that's just come through from Sophia. Um, um, yeah, she just missed the first presentation. So what are the ultimate plans for the building? So um, originally we'd been looking at leasing the building out primarily as um, office space and with community use. Um, uh, clearly due to COVID, whether there'll be such a demand for office space is quite another matter. We are... Um, currently just started doing a business plan looking at potential new uses for the building and we will be consulting with the community on that plan. Um, uh, I mean I'm assuming there will still be an element of office space but I suspect it will not be as much as we had previously anticipated. We're looking potentially at educational users um, and potentially a small community cafe as well. So, you know, realistically, the building is to be thrown open to everybody um, who wants to come in and use it and benefit from the services that are going to be offered in it. But I think it will only thrive as a mixed use building that is very much used and loved um, by the people in the local area. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so where are we? Well, we have managed to catch up quite a bit of time, which is mm. good. Um, so I hope I didn't rush through my presentation too fast. I was just conscious that we'd had a bit of a late start. Um, but we do have a break now in the um, programme, so everybody can get a cup of coffee. Um, we are going to slightly change the order of our um, second session. Crosby, who is going to talk interpretation plans, needs to leave. So um, we're going to pop him in at 11.35 and um, Susan Han and Chris Wells will talk after that. So if um, everybody is happy, I suggest we all come back here as originally planned on the programme at 10 past 11. Um, you don't need to log out. I will stop recording um, and if everybody just shuts off their um, video and audio, then that's fine. And we'll come back and open up at 10 past 11. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome back, everybody. It's now 10 past 11. Hopefully everybody is uh, back here. And I'm now going to ask Susan to talk again about uh, how to create an exhibition. And in this, she is also um, supported by a number of the volunteers. Susan, yeah. yeah. Apologies. 
the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, it's a pleasure to talk about interpretation. Um, and I'm going to do this in two parts because um, our volunteers are being represented by one of, um, of one of them today. And she's recorded a piece which I'd like to play to you first together with some images from the two exhibitions, and then I'll come on to the meat of um, my talk as well. But frankly, she steals my thunder. So I give you um, Jenny Tatton. Susan, are we supposed to be hearing anything? Oh. Is the sound not coming through? I can't hear it, no. Oh, I don't believe it. What a shame. Um, Hannah, do you want to see if you can do it? Is there a is there a mute or? Um, I can have a go on mine. Hang on, let me see. If you could, would you mind, Hannah? Sorry. Ah, oh, hang on. Share computer sound. Shall I start again? Go on then. Let me start again. Apologies. Is that morning? It's just not a good morning, is it? <laughs> display. There were display cases holding objects and items related to our story. When planning the exhibition, the museum's curator asked that we consider our target audience and suggested that we should bring our tale story alive at a level accessible to 11 year olds. Quite a challenge, but this certainly gave us focus. Then as a training exercise, we checked out the current exhibition and museum display cases with particular emphasis on judging labeling style content and relevance of the text in order to pick up ideas and assess their impact and whether they met the curator's intentions and got their message across. We discussed our findings together and then wrote labels of our own concentrating on information, impact, clarity, engagement and length using no more than 30 words. We also chose objects and items for the display cases, all of which were left behind when we entered lockdown, as it was not possible to relocate them. The initial exhibition was open just a day and a half. Starting from a base of everything being available, we quickly learnt that due to space, copyright, insurance issues and budgets, we had to assess and choose and then place only objects and items available to us in the display cases. These needed to inform, engage and illustrate, where possible, all aspects of our stories. Some linked to the church itself, while others touched on individuals and the social conditions in which they lived. In the original exhibition, one display case was dedicated to personal items representing mourning customs, while in others, for example, clippings from local newspapers told their own stories. We are very fortunate, however, to have been able to relocate the joyful children's art into the current exhibition where it looks particularly appropriate in the setting of the building and the stained glass that inspired it.
As for the themes and images on the panel displays, once we had researched the burial records, the people and their stories came alive. The individual tales were so fascinating, strong and varied, that when we grouped them together with some careful analysis, the panel themes more or less jumped out at us. Then it was a case of choosing a mix of individual stories to capture the interest of the audience and bring our subjects colorful lives to their attention with the addition of images and relevant facts. Naturally, the theme of Holy Trinity, past, present and future had to be addressed along with the social conditions at that time in order to present the full picture. I cannot finish without mentioning Chris Wells, the graphic designer, who left no stone unturned in designing and setting out the panels. While volunteering during the exhibition, I have repeatedly been aware of the visual impact, clarity, and the care taken to achieve a balanced and elegant result. Lastly, the beautiful set out double-sided takeaway map, allowing you to guide yourself through the stories and the streets walking in the footsteps of our earlier neighbours adds another dimension and is a final exuberant flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, very much. And apologies for the, the fluffing up by me. Jenny's actually with us today, so I'm sure I'm sure she wouldn't mind answering some questions if people want to ask her how it was being um, a volunteer on this project. Right, we'll now move on to um, my summary and I, I'm going to try and <laughs> do this in 10 minutes. Um, Jenny has put it so eloquently um, and I think the key thing about this experience of curating an exhibition is that we all started as novices and I count myself in it. I have not helped curate an exhibition before, but at the training we got from our expert, Ros Curry at Islington Museum and the team teamwork to create this um, with all the partners that we now identified, um, but especially our, our designer, Chris, who you'll be hearing from later. So how to curate an exhibition, I, it's outrageous that I'm even telling you this, but this is my perspective from what, how we learned, and it is possible to learn in a, in a space of a few months, how to deliver a show that people want to visit and enjoy visiting. So Ros is training very much in the three workshops that she, she um, shared with us, was very much getting us to think about an exhibition plan. Planning, is so essential. Um, and this is something that she will do for her exhibitions at the museum. She does, works with other community groups. She has a great variety of exhibitions that are on display. And we, we as Jenny was able to say, went to have a look at them and to critique them and to comment on them. But the key things that we need to think about uh, to find your audiences, aims and key messages and keep revisiting them. Do, do your plans, do your ideas fit these. Now for us, the audiences, <clears throat> we identified as the local community, primary school children, thinking particularly of the children working um, with the artists at New River College, that's a primary school, potential funders and supporters who might help us save the, the fabric of the building for the future, journalists and local politicians, so influencers, influential people, um, to get people on side. Um, and the aims, we wanted to aim, explain the significance of the church and why it was worth um, maintaining and restoring, understanding who were the first residents of the area, describing the realities of their lives, and of course, flagging up that we need to find a future for the building. So some of the key messages that were, were brainstormed, who built the streets, who held power, precariousness of success, the proximity of the workhouse. It literally it loomed over the site, which was developed in it, you know, um, after the workhouse was in the area, in the Liverpool Road area. 
and then health and infant mortality. It was hard not to be moved by the number of children and infants buried in the crypt and to, to want to share that with the audience. So as Jenny said, we had many constraints and I think this is really important to understand your constraints right at the start and to be clear. Um, space, how much space do you have? Measure and plan, space for displays, both wall area and in the cabinet. Copyright, establish copyright permissions. Do you need to pay for, um, for dish, uh, reproduction rights? Are you allowed to use this image? Um, all those things. What's your budget like? Um, does it allow for these things? The condition of objects and images, are they suitable for display or are they too fragile? Attain appropriate level of insurance. Um, this is something obviously the museum had in, in place and I'm sure most of the places that you're already thinking about has insurance, but are you bringing any loan items in? You need to check these things out. Work within your budget. Um, it's a small project, we didn't have a lavish budget, but I think actually that was a necessary constraint because it meant we had to focus, that's never a bad thing. And be resourceful. Um, I say that because this image here, um, taken from Illustrated London News, uh, I was looking at find, buying the image for 50 pounds. Doesn't sound much, but we didn't have a lavish budget. But actually, lo and behold, I mentioned it to the archivist and they had a copy of it in the local history centre. So ask, see if you can make use of what's under your nose, even if you're not sure of it. So back to Rebecca's point, talk to the experts, work with them. Identify your themes. As I flagged up in my previous um, presentation, we, we, we color coded our themes. We wrote text, selected object, images and objects. And as Jenny has said, is the key um, things we had to think about, make the text accessible, keep it focused and concise, aim for 150 words, maybe 200 words per panel, and keep to 30 words per caption. I think we all <laughs> screamed inwardly when we heard Roz tell us this, but my goodness, she was absolutely right. Um, images for reproduction on the panels, do they illustrate the theme? What do they add? Is the copyright suitable and um, is, is the image, uh, will it withstand reproduction? Will it come out well? And then finally, the objects and images in the display cases ensure that they illustrate the theme and assess condition and display correctly. So here's a mixture of images uh, that we used. So we've got on the right hand side, the newspaper cuttings that Jenny talked about the headline grabbing crypt kids play among the coffins jumps out on the bottom shelf who wouldn't want to read more but yet we could only display those um, newspaper cuttings as found they are mounted on um, cardboard can't do anything else with them so they had to just be displayed as found really in the archives the postcard down below was something I found on eBay just a little bit of serendipitous browsing uh, it's now in the Islington archives and then the morning letter with the border is um, an item which Jenny herself actually shared from her own personal collection to give the idea of how mourning was flagged in um, and, and uh, well, all prevalent really in this period of the 19th century. So just quickly to show you one panel and to take it part, apart a little, we've got the rage for buildings. So that fits with our theme of who built the streets. Text, we came in at 145 words, I think very respectable. Um, images, we had a watercolor painting in the archives, a plan likewise in the Saint archives, and then a black and white photograph. So they're not all the same. It was very easy just to have this um, exhibition full of black and white photographs. That wasn't what we wanted. And the object, the um, uh, postcard of a horse-drawn omnibus in Thornhill Road, that was too small and insignificant to actually reproduce. It worked better as an object. This is your story taking. So making connections with the past and the artwork um, with thoughtful and intelligent design throughout the exhibition. So this is how the silhouette idea came in. The silhouettes were um, of the children in, taken in the art workshops, holding props from the Victorian era. They were used as the, um, in the design panels by Chris, who also looked at some of the um, archives that Rebecca had found in the, um, about the church, looking at the typeface and reproducing that in his wonderful bold titles. 
So overcoming challenges and being adaptable. My goodness, we've all we're all learning this um, super fast at the moment, aren't we? Just to say, exhibition one in the first version in the museum in the local history centre that was already challenging. It was a split site on two floors, separate access and different opening hours, and of course it closed early due to national lockdown, a day and a half. Second version of the exhibition. I've put it here, it's located on a building site. There's no two ways about it. It's dusty and we had to make to find room for the panels where we could. No display cabinets and not museum standard. Limited opening hours. It had been open every Saturday for three hours. Needs to be COVID compliant. Everyone's social distancing, wearing masks, hand wash, everything like that. Limited number of people in the exhibition. Obviously the talks and workshops have been delivered digitally. And guess what, close early due to national lockdown. So here's quickly some top tips from the TAILS team. What makes a good exhibition? Clarity, keep in view your aims and key messages, test your ideas and hone your plan. Communication, work at making your stories accessible. Will people want to read about these people? Blend text, images and objects to tell them. Finally, collaboration, seek training and mentoring from experts. Really, really important. Without Roz's um, guidance and leadership, we really wouldn't have delivered anything worth looking at, I don't think. And work closely with your designer to maximize the impact of the stories and realize your vision. And of course, you have to have cake. What makes a good team? Tea, coffee, cake, refreshments. So how will you know you've succeeded? Evaluate and ask for feedback. Undertake your own review. Did the exhibition achieve its aims? Has it reached its intended audiences? And has the exhibition enabled more people to enjoy heritage? And finally, is there a design for future projects? You've got these people coming to see your current display, but is there a desire for more? Are there other aspects of the heritage which the community would like to investigate? And are the volunteers keen to continue? Um, and not prejudging those responses, um, I think it should be a, a positive yes. So thank you for listening. This is just a little image of us as we um, open to the public on the first day of the second version of the exhibition. So thank you. Are there any questions? We have some in chat, Susan. Okay, I'll just have a look now. Oh. So, yeah, the first one is about guidance documents for copyright. There's lots of information. Um, I would suggest, that's a very good question. You can see I'm not a, um, an expert in this, but uh, the British Library has very useful, um, I think essentially what I would suggest is look at where the archives you would wish to um, make use of the images. Rebecca and I, when we've gone into archives to photograph them, you have to send, sign a disclaimer form, ask the person there when you're taking images of the archives, can we reuse them? The London Metropolitan Archives is very good on how to go through getting permissions. Um, but I, it's archive and object specific. So for instance, a photograph of a painting from the 1830s, well, the 1830s, that's not in copyright, surely. Well, the photograph might be. It, there is no straightforward answer, I would say. Um, I mean, Rebecca, would you have anything to add? Um, no, just, just be very, very careful, um, you know, including putting things up on Zoom. Um, which makes me hesitate to say this um, when it's recorded. But yeah, tug, find out which archives have things that you would like and go and ask them or email them. Um, but it's really important. You don't want to get caught out. I mean, most people don't do it deliberately, but if you can sort that out at the beginning, it makes life easier. Lovely, thank you. Shall um, we move on to the next one, Rosie? Yes, that would be good. So was diversity part of your audience planning um, with the question, who had power? I think that's a really good question. I mean, in terms of diversity, um, one of the issues that came up quite quickly was um, 
well, just the gender issue in who had power in households, who um, between men and women, obviously was the church um, staffed by men only, where was the role of women? That was one of the things, and, and it, there was some surprising findings from that. In terms of diversity um, of backgrounds, um, what again was, it just jumped out of the material is, um, where the origins of the money and I suppose the power of some of these people living in this area and we were able to identify two slave owners uh, amongst the people buried in the crypt. Now it would take another research project and further effort to work out exactly who might have been those people who were enslaved and worked for those individuals um, and that's not to say that's something that couldn't happen but it, it couldn't be within the scope of this this project where the research was confined to really no more than six months. Um, so diversity, I think, was certainly part of our audience planning in that um, we wanted it to reach out to as wider a group of the community as Rosie's outlined already. Um, but I would say it wasn't a specific target of the themes, just being mindful of what uh, was the context of the times. So that's, that's I think, the best way of answering. Okay, I'm now looking at the next question and oh my goodness, it's a brilliant one. How do you decide on height for panels? It's a lot to read standing up and not visible from a seat or wheelchair. How do you, did you address access would be really useful to know. Um, I think you found the weak spot um, and I was going to share weaknesses. Um, can I just say firstly about one of the, the panels because they were designed for the exhibition space, Chris very carefully measured, there were a couple of um, tall pillars downstairs um, and we filled up the space with text thinking, hey, we've got lots of room for text. So Rebecca's lovely chronology filled a panel and it was only when it came to installation that the curator said, hang on, can't really read the top. Bit of a fail there. <laughs> so in all our planning is still, until you see the physical thing, you realize we've failed there. And that's something we've learned from, it wasn't suitable. It's a very good point that you say about not visible from a seat or wheelchair. <clears throat> in terms of height, it was, I think about, um, the lowest point was about um, 90 centimeters off the ground, but obviously that's very site specific. It would be possible to change it um, and think about how you would place the text and the images so that you could have the text lower. Um, I think we were aiming for it to be visible, um, legible from a, a wide audience, certainly, and not to have them too high. We succeeded with some and failed with others. Um, access is a really good point. Um, museum and um, local archives, uh, wheelchair, fully wheelchair accessible, the church, not so much. Um, but let's face it, it was a home that we could find uh, for the exhibition. It is it would be possible to get a wheelchair in, but I think it would need help, so it's not fully accessible. I think Rosie would agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Is the exhibition permanent? Um, well, it's in place at the moment, and we hope to reopen it next year for another month or so. It bit depends on, I think, Rosie's answer about um, what happens next with the building. Um, and what is going to happen to the archival material if it is temporary? If I understand that correctly, is all the material that we've gathered um, is being shared, uh, the output is being shared digitally, um, any research notes or whatever, they aren't being stored in any one place. The archives just doesn't have room for that. Um, so it's the outputs, the outcomes, like the summary of tales and things like that. But Alina, you may want to ask another question if I've not answered that correctly. Um, and finally, what did you do with the information about slave owners? Did you give that story to people to display? They are in the displays. Um, they are there as part of um, the fortunes and where do people make their money? How did they come to own the, uh, lease these lovely houses in Islington? But as I say, this is the, we were flagging up really who these people were, not really writing the, the final version of their stories. And this is something that it would be very good to follow up. Obviously, we'll be sharing the outputs with um, UCL, who, whose database we used for accessing this information. And hopefully that's a two-way process that maybe some of the volunteers may want to continue researching. Uh, 
Okay, just reading the rest of the um, question. Surprised that we went on, went ahead and put on the exhibition in an inaccessible venue. It is accessible, am I right, Rosie? I mean, it. Do you have a, a thought on that? Um, yes. Well, we certainly could. Um, but I think we could get a wheelchair in. Um, I mean, it's not. It is not ideal, but. Um, the idea was to try and get uh, as many people of the local community in the building as possible. And yes, we do uh, have an access consultant on board um, as part of the long term plans for the project. So clearly, when the building is fully refurbished, it will be completely accessible and step free. Um, but until we've secured that funding, uh, we can't manage to do that now. Um, and in terms of shifting the exhibition out of the museum, we had to do that because Islington Museum wanted the next exhibition that was lined up to be displayed and therefore they said regretfully ours had to vacate the space. So, um, you know, realistically, you know, putting it into the Cloudsley Centre did seem to be a good option at the time. Can I just say, in oh. case anyone missed it, sorry, Susan, um, the PDFs um, of the panels are available on the Diocese of London website. So although it's nothing like visiting the exhibition, you can actually see um, what the panels look like. It's a very good point. And, and I would just say that um, it isn't ideal. I'm sorry, I, 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 um, the accessibility in the Clousey Centre, but there would be no exhibition if at all, if it, we hadn't moved there. Um, Islington Museum isn't actually open to the public. Um, uh, and I'm sorry if it, you know, it hasn't been possible for people to visit. And that's something that may we need to think about when we think about uh, in answer to the, the permanence of the, the displays. And that's, that's, you know, much appreciated. I know I saw one wheelchair there. That's not one wheelchair user there. That's not enough, I know, but, um, um, we were faced with it being open, I think, for a day and a half, or, you know, it's a challenge. I think it's an absolute, right, you're absolutely, it's a challenge. Um, okay, so, um, are we, I think, um, if we've had all the questions, uh, for Susan, I will then now move on, um, as I said, to a slight change in the order to Frank. Um, so Frank Crosby is going to talk to us about um, interpretation planning, and he uh, has a background in um, museum curation and went on to co-found Tricolor, which is uh, a private, um, sorry, a, a professional consultancy um, developing activity plans and heritage interpretation planning. Thank you, Rosie. Good morning, everybody from uh, increasingly sunny East Cambridgeshire. Um, I will endeavour to share my screen now. Fingers crossed. And hopefully the magic has happened. How's that? Everybody see that screen? Yep, perfect. Right, thank Thanks, you. Frank. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's talk interpretation, more interpretation. Um, I'm going to talk about quite high level stuff. Um, Susan went into splendid detail earlier, and some of the things I'm going to say, no doubt Susan will have mentioned or some of the previous speakers, but that's all good stuff because we're trying to, trying to drive home very important things for you to bear in mind. Um, I'm assuming that what you're going to be doing, um, you will need funding for it or you are already funded. I'm broadly going to be following the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, recommended process. Um, this is interpretation pre-COVID on the whole, but we can pick up COVID in the Q&A. Uh, we're assuming that uh, the funders that may be referenced are still operating in a perfect world. Whether they are or not, fundraising is incredibly competitive. I probably don't need to tell you that, uh, but you will significantly improve your chances of success by 
careful planning and um, and gathering research to back up your proposals. And if you do it right, um, interpretation will, it won't just bring new and different audiences to your, to your venue, um, it can help funders achieve their aims and that will make everybody very happy. So, um, what's the purpose of the interpretation? Right at the very beginning, you need to be just having a really good think about that. Um, my belief in this is that you need to be developing a visitor experience. It isn't an exhibition. You need to be thinking about what do you want people to leave your venue knowing and feeling. And that's one of the distinctions between just doing exhibition and interpretation. Um, you develop interpretation with a really good understanding of audiences and their needs and preferences. Um, so right at the beginning of this process, the other thing you need to ask yourself is what do you know already about your audiences, the people that come to your, your venue? Next thing to do is to assess the assets. Um, assets, the assets that can help you tell your story. Um, it's the, um, could be objects, could be um, things in your archive, could be the build, building features themselves. And while we're on the subject, and you mentioned, uh, Susan mentioned um, copyright earlier, do you have good imagery of the things that you want to be talking about? Do you have video of them? If not, you need to be thinking about that. The other thing to consider at this, at this stage is what areas and spaces do you have available for the interpretation? Uh, and I recommend that you think holistically. Don't just think about what you can do inside the building. Think about the outside as well. And uh, the image we put up there is just something we did for St. Botolph's in Boston, Lincolnshire, a few years ago. They wanted to link uh, the main church with uh, a historic building across the way. And to link the two together, we proposed uh, some surface treatment between the two, the two buildings. So think outside, what can you do on the building and around the building? As part of assessing the assets, um, think about local archives, Susan mentioned, of course. Archival research is really, really important source for, uh, for things that could really um, significantly add to what you're gonna be presenting. What information is out there in local museums, archives, online, private collections, whatever, the two pictures I've put there. We've done some work recently with St. Peter's in Brighton uh, we had a rummage on their behalf in the local archive and found uh, that is a plan that shows the, uh, the original, the very first drawing that proposed the location for St. Peter's Church in the early 19th century. Uh, and the, the church didn't know this existed. And that's a really nice piece to find. The picture next to it, which Rosie will be familiar with, um, that's from uh, Newport Minster on the Isle of Wight. That's a 17th century font, which was, uh, I'm going to say, misplaced, in inverted commas, uh, when the church was uh, redeveloped in Victorian times, and then it turned up relatively recently uh, in somebody's back garden as a bird bath, and now it's back in its rightful place. So it's important that you look outside uh, of your building as well to see what may be available. Um, Again, I'm going to be going over some of the things that other people have, have said. I'm not going to go on about it too much. Um, developing stories and themes, giving up workshops with staff, volunteers, local experts. Pick the brains of anyone that can help, really. And as you're mapping out the key stories and themes, just remember the people stories. It's not all about the stuff. Um, I think I'll, I'll mention later on, but just remember that not everybody that's going to come into your place is an architectural historian and will know what all these things are. You need to tell them. But remember, people, people stories. And at this stage, you also need to be having a good think about how the information could be best presented. Um, and just because you think it's interesting, it doesn't mean that they will. So you need to find out about that, more of that in a second. And you also need to be thinking now about layering. Um, some people come in and be quite happy just to cast their eye over what you've got. 
be in there for 10 minutes and go away and be quite happy with that. You need to present information in a way that they can pick up, pick up the key things easily if they don't want to drill down. Um, consultation, visitor market research, absolutely vital, absolutely vital. Um, you must, you absolutely must know your audiences. You must know what their preferences are. You need to understand your community, uh, the people who you consider to be potential audiences if they're not engaged now. You need to understand their preferences, how they like information presented to them. Are they all digital themes? Or are they quite other? Do they prefer, uh, for example, guided tours? And you need to understand the marketplace, which is a dreadful kind of business speak term, but it's absolutely vital that you do. You need to understand what's going on uh, just outside of your walls to see if there's anything out there you can tap into. If you don't do that, your interpretation could end up missing the mark. And this is the opportunity through consultation and research to eliminate assumptions that anybody might be making about audiences and what they might like. So you can sound them out, uh, sound out the audiences and ideally potential audiences, non-visitors about the proposed themes or stories and about how they want the stuff presented to them. And how you do that, even before COVID, we were finding more and more that online consultation is working uh, very effectively. It's not one size doesn't fit all, but it's it's very useful, especially now. Uh, we can pick that up in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, as part of the research and just understanding what's going on outside your walls, think bigger picture and look at local initiatives. Um, like these high street regeneration schemes that are going on around the country. There's lots of them going on. And the reason I mention that is because a lot of them have got money that they are happy to put into things that will help them further their cause. If your exhibition could, for example, and this is something that the project I mentioned earlier that Rosie and I have been working on, uh, on the Minster on the Isle of Wight, part of the proposed exhibition there uh, it isn't just about the church, it's about the history of the town, because that history isn't told anywhere else. And by us committing to doing that, that piqued the interest of, of other funding streams. So think about the context and how the story you want to tell may be able to fit into something else that could bring money to you. And also linked with that, is there a demand for uh, temporary exhibition space locally? Should you be able to build in, could you build in temporary exhibition space to refresh what you've got or just have a standalone temporary exhibition area? When it comes back to the audiences themselves, you really need to understand local need um, in terms of uh, languages, foreign languages, um, uh, disability, accessibility. And one of the starting points for all of that, that I, or my go to document is the, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment document, which is uh, produced by usually by local health boards. And that will give you some really key statistics that would tell you, for example, if there is an above average incidence of people who are visually impaired in your area. So at this stage, you must be, you must remember, you should be opening doors for people and not, not closing them by making um, decisions without the proper research behind it. And um, best practice, look to see what other people are doing elsewhere or what's working there. And I'll put a little prompt in there to remind me, visual aid. This, this piece of paper uh, that I'm waving around here, this came from Canterbury Cathedral a few years ago. Um, it's a bookmark that they gave away to visitors, but it's actually tactile and you can't see on zoom, of course, but all the whole shape of the cathedral um, is raised. So someone who is visually impaired could get a sense just from this little piece of paper. Can't um, see it at all. You're not holding it up. I'm holding it up at the camera. Yeah, but we can't see it. All we can see is the slide. You can see the screen, can't you? Well, I'll show it at the end. OK, of course. Visual aid at the end. Uh, 
So by this stage, you should have a much better idea of the form of the content that your interpretation will take, however that's going to be, whether it's audio tours or histories, might be 3D models, might be an app. Um, at this stage, you could start developing mood boards, gathering images of relevant examples of the things that you like from elsewhere. Uh, and that's the point at which you could start to work with a designer or a consultant and start working up some initial concepts. Um, the, screen, the screen is showing you now really the kind of the four stages of, of uh, interpretation development. So top left, we've got some very initial drawings that we did for Ely Museum to show how uh, the, the display may be laid out. Then top right, that's uh, Upton Park in Dorset, and it, that's when it starts to start, start to look slightly more realistic. Bottom left, that's some work we did at Sutton Who, uh, in one of their spaces, when you're actually, you have a really strong sense then of the shape, the size, the color, the exact location of everything. And then the last picture shows uh, a final installation. So they're broadly the four stages. Um, so you must remember the layering when it comes to, interpre to interpretation information and remember that people absorb information very differently. You must remember durability as well, because um, you know, this stuff will need to last potentially for years and years. So it needs to be durable. Um, this is where you need to start about accurate costing. And I put this in bold, do not guess. We come across countless projects where people thought they knew how much uh, X, Y, and Z cost. And they are 99% of the time, they undercook it. And that is not helpful at all. So you could start to gather with, with the right help, you could start to gather accurate costs. And you need to start, you need to start thinking about evaluation here too. Um, testing comes in once you start starting to develop your, your ideas. Uh, you can go back to the audiences. Um, and uh, height in wheelchairs, which came up, came up earlier. This is a good, a good time for you to be thinking about those kind of things. If you've got, and I appreciate that, you know what I said at the beginning, one size does not fit all. Uh, and it really depends on the scale of what you're, what you're going to be doing and how much time you've got and how much money you've got. But testing um, is something that you really should endeavor to do to make sure that you've interpreted everybody's uh, responses correctly. Uh, and this drags you along to the point where you can finalize interpretation depending on the project scale. You might want to create the 3D visualizations like the ones I showed earlier. You can produce technical but not manufacturing drawings, they come later. You can develop a project delivery plan and that's important. Um, you know, you need to work out how long everything's going to take, who's going to do it, what the, uh, the dependencies are, if there's other capital works going on, and get that captured on paper. Uh, you also need to think about a management and maintenance plan and the associated costs. So by that, if that hasn't come up already, uh, let's say you've got uh, a display area with um, 20 spotlights in it, those bulbs are going to go and you need to have a, ma a maintenance plan in place for maintaining the exhibition, for cleaning it appropriately, who's doing it, who's doing it when, what kind of preventative maintenance can happen. If it comes to those 20 spotlights, uh, are they special bulbs? Where do they come from? How much do they cost? Um, how should they be handled? Are they halogen bulbs? And so on. And this is the point as well in the management maintenance plan. Remember the object care. If you have objects on display in cases, um, that needs to be factored in to the management and maintenance plan. And this will get you to the point where you can develop a final accurate budget, which is um, at the cornerstone of it all. So at this point now, well done, you've got your um, interpretation plan. So ideally, this is not a one-time document. It's evolving, it's dynamic, it's something that you add to. Um, it's a plan 
that will help you deliver the interpretation. It's a record of how you did it, and that's very important for funders. It's an owner's manual as well, because um, you know if you have turnover of staff uh, and volunteers, this comes back to the management and maintenance aspect of it, it's important that somebody can pick something off a shelf and go, ah, right, that's what we need to do, fine. And the show can go on. Um, and the work that you'll do to develop an interpretation plan, it can help you engage other funders as well because of the discipline and the research has to go into it. Um, one size won't fit all, but crucially, you know, you must listen to the audiences and document it. And you can start gathering information now. If you're planning interpretation, you can start to start gather, to gather information now and start talking to people about their preferences. And please, please don't guess the budget. Um, I was asked to share as well uh, any funders. So our, our church funding specialist at Trickler, Haley, she gave me this list to stick up on here. Uh, not all of them um, are necessarily accepting applications now, um, but I'll be happy to share that list around um, later, or Hannah can perhaps. Um, but all the things that I've outlined in terms of research, you know, you would, they would stand you in good stead with, with pretty well everybody. So, that's that. We'll now go into questions. I will stop sharing and I will then immediately hold this up. This is the thing I was waving at the screen earlier, realizing I was, you couldn't see it. This is the simple, um, this is a simple uh, bookmark that Canterbury Cathedral are giving out. Uh, we see we are an equal opportunities employer. This is Alfred Cat here to come to join us. <laughs> um, so this, you know, you can't see it on the screen. This, all the features of the cathedral are raised on this very simple, flimsy piece of paper. And I always, I always think that's a marvelous thing. Anyway, there we go. Questions then. So are we going to the... Thank you, Frank. Thank um, you. Hello, by the way. Hello. <laughs> We've been emailing. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. There are quite a few questions that oh, have popped up okay. um, in the chat. Yeah. Um, so the first one is from Holly. She says, where does this planning sit in a major two-stage um, NLHF project. It seems to be part of the 18 month funded development period. Mm. You already need to have costings, outcomes, outputs, and audiences identified. Yeah, it, it really depends on um, when, when you say major NLHF project, it depends what you mean by major. Now, as uh, I think we have a colleague from, from the fund with us today, somewhere on here. I thought I saw a name earlier. Um, mm -hmm. It won't do you any harm to, to, do, to spend a lot of time on this right at the beginning. Uh, now, if that becomes before the funded development period, then that, that would you be doing it on your own dime, as they say. However, um, it is money well spent because it will make sure that you, um, that you go in to the second round um, in a very robust form. And we've done that for people, for people on major projects. They've worked up very advanced um, interpretation plans and activity plans um, to support the round one. And then much of the development phase is actually spent on really, really detailed refinement and testing. So Thanks. hopefully that helps. Yeah, I think just following up what you're saying there with a question, Beth has got two questions, but I'm just going to say her second one first. So Beth is just asking, in your opinion, is it possible to develop an interpretation plan without without a, a sort of a professional consultant? Um, I think I think it's tricky and um, not least of all, because right now there is no um, if we talk in NLHF, there is no NLHF guidance right now for interpretation. The interpretation um, that that if you can find it out there hidden away on various websites is seven years old um, and it leaves 
uh, a lot to the imagination in terms of how you interpret the guidance. Um, I think that um, I'd be happy to talk to you separately about this if you if you wish. Um, and essentially, if you you work out the stories you want to tell, um, understand, really understand what your audiences, potential audiences want, what your funders want, and as long as you're you uh, you will need a designer at some point, and it's this it's it's important not to fall into the trap of of thinking that someone who can design who can design something that goes on the wall is an interpretation designer, because most of the time they're not. But uh, whoever asked the question, sorry, I'd be happy to if you want to. Uh, I could I'd be happy to have a chat on the phone to you about it. Okay, thanks, Frank. Yeah, we could we could try and link link you up with Beth. Um, her other question was, um, can you talk a bit more about online consultation workshops? How well have they worked in the past, and with the view that regulations around COVID nineteen may continue? Mm. Well, we uh, at, we at Trickler we were we were no strangers to Zoom before lockdown. We were already using it quite a lot, um, and it was partly because it was it, it was so hard to pin so many kind of disparate groups down. Um, it can it can work really well, and I think as with any. Um, consultation research program it's all about the planning and just making sure that you're asking the right questions and being mindful that more and more people these days are spending more and more time on zoom with, for work and their families and everything else and if they're faced with a um, a two-hour consultation workshop then they may lose the bill to live so um they absolutely do work and we've been running them throughout covid um for very different types of organizations. Um, but you can treat them, you should treat them as if you would, you know, a room full of people. Break them up in bite-sized chunks, make them fun, use breakout rooms as well if you're using Zoom, for example. Uh, but digital consultation is generally, um, you know, using things like um, SurveyMonkey uh, or those kind of platforms they can, they're really easy to use and people, especially during lockdowns, seem much more, much keener to think, yeah, I'll spend a few minutes on a survey. Thank you. Um, one more, um, Anna is just following up on what you were saying about the level of input upfront you need in, put into interpretation plans when applying to the lottery. Um, he's just noting that that seem, would, it implies that there would be a significant uh, costs involved before you've even applied to the lottery. Um, so he's just raising the point that most parish churches don't have that level of money Absolutely. to hand in yeah. order to develop an interpretation plan up front, or at least some of it. Can, up I, can I pop in there? Because um, uh, as Frank has said, we've been working on a project, Newport Minster, together. And um, uh, when I put the first round application into the lottery, I identified the key interpretation themes. Um, and I did that by discussing it with um, uh, the PCC, members of the community and congregation and between us, we identified what we thought were the key themes and I wrote them out in the application. And I did no more than that in terms of trying to secure the first round funding. So I don't think uh, you need to do um, you don't need to develop a draft interpretation plan or anything like that to apply for funding, but you do need to have a good understanding of uh, the heritage um, of your building. So a statement of significance is obviously important and would be needed and, um, and just take soundings from other people because I was amazed how much was known in the local community um, and how much I could bolster the application by doing that. Hmm. Um. I suppose Holly's question, Holly's question, when she said major, you know, I'm, um, all the major bids, they are, they are competitive, you know, and you, major bids, you would be up against people who probably have invested some money, but for smaller amounts of money, um, as Rosie said, you know, there is, there is no need, you need to demonstrate you have a really good understanding 
of it, of the process. Is that helpful? Um, thank you, Frank. I think I think so. Um, yeah, so I don't think there are any more questions, um, but by all means, if you do have further questions, feel free to email them to Becky and then she can pass them on to the relevant speakers afterwards. And then we'll get back to you individually. Um, so I'd just like now to ask thank you, Frank. Susan. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Frank. So yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd just like um, Susan now um, from Islington Guided Walks to talk through the process um, that we went through in terms of developing the walks and uh, her role in the project. Thank you, Susan. Uh, hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Hahn, as Rosie just said, from Islington Guided Walks, and just bear with me while I try and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Great. Well, what I'm going to talk about briefly today is a little bit about who we are, Islington Guided Walks, how we got involved with the project, outline some of the advantages of walking tours. Um, and some of that's personal, and I'll just give a couple of kind of academic examples and then describe how we developed the uh, Tales from the Crypt walk. So who are we? Um, Islington Guided Walks is the kind of trading name, if you like, of Clark and Well and Islington Guiding Association. And we are about 100 plus guides um, founded in the 1980s. So we've had 30 years of a relationship with Clerkenwell and Islington. And although the all the guides don't necessarily guide, they're involved in local history and blogging, all of them now are trained, if you like, through a University of Westminster course. So tour guiding courses started for um, Westminster and Clerkenwell uh, in, again in the 1980s, but from 2009 we found our home at the University of Westminster and there it's a diploma course with academic accreditation and you learn guiding skills, how to guide um, successfully or kind of prepare a, uh, an entertaining and interesting uh, walk and uh, also about the local area itself. How did myself and my colleague Una get involved in the project? Well, I think it was from really quite early on, if I think about um, Rosie's introduction and she talked about the kind of planning stages. Um, I was asked to a very early meeting with the Diocese of London when I think before you put in um, your bid to the uh, Heritage Fund, um, because I had worked on preparing walks for the Cloudsley Foundation, a local charity that was uh, had recently celebrated its 500 year anniversary. Dr. Kathy Ross, a very well-known London historian, had written the history as part of those celebrations. And we were asked to uh, prepare a walk from that to share all this wonderful um, learning about Cloudsley's relationship with Islington Borough from 1517 onwards. Um, and so we were invited to come along to very early meetings and also to share our research and knowledge of the area, which we did. And in those initial plans, uh, the idea was for a couple of, of walks. Um, Uh, oh. it's, uh, did you lose me there for a minute? Yes, we did. Well, at least I did. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I've just had a th sign saying my internet's unstable. It's been very good all morning. Um, when did you lose me? Uh, why walk? 
I walk. Okay, great. Don't think you missed much, missed much then. I'm going to give you a very personal view of why we walk to start off with, you know, why I like to walk. And it's become particularly poignant for me now where I've been preparing Zoom walks uh, for people and virtual tours. And it's something about the physical connection with the place, feet on the ground. Um, it can be the sounds. Um, there's no bell at Holy Trinity in Fazley Square, but you can have church bells. If I was doing a walk in Clerkenwell, you can still hear where the River Fleet runs under some of the roads somewhere. So it can be a very physical experience. What you're looking at as well, and again, that was very powerful for this uh, project because the houses and the streets, as, as uh, so many of the presenters have, have described and shown, are still there, largely there. Um, and even if the houses have been restored, uh, they're in their original places. I like the pace of walking. Um, when we prepare a tour, we probably would expect to have about an hour's talking. And if you get all of that in one go, you can't absorb it. It's very hard to keep going and maintain your interest. And walking gives you time to uh, reflect and absorb um, and kind of gives you a little bit more stamina, if you like. Uh, there's a sharing aspect of a walking tour. Not only are you sharing in the guide's interpretation of uh, the themes, but also your fellow walkers. And this can hugely enrich um, the experience for, for people. And again, particularly on this one, when we've had volunteers and local residents, uh, volunteers who've got this kind of intimate connection with the material, but also local residents who, you know, can go back decades of the local area. Um, and that is very enriching for myself as a guide, but also for fellow participants. Um, and it's sociable. It enables people, I think, to have, again, as I said, more stamina about uh, staying with a topic and understanding it. There were a couple, when I was looking to prepare this, there were a couple of uh, academic um, uh, research projects that I that I kind of came across or remembered, particularly from my training, both of them from the 21st century, which I think is significant maybe from this and and uh, touch on some of the themes that have been raised already. One of them is a New York a study of New York walking guides called Reenchanting the City, the Urban Alchemists, about how you can transform your relationship with the built environment through revelatory stories. Um, but also the aim of incorporating chance and serendipity about something. And again, here, that element of chance comes from, from who you're on the tour with, which it makes it more unpredictable. Um, and the idea of wanting to transform the participants into, I mean, better is not quite the right word, but more engaged urban dwellers. And you transform this everyday activity of walking uh, into walking as a kind of purposeful, almost intellectual activity. You can walk as a Marxist, you can walk as the root of a political protest, or in this case, you're walking as a 19th century Barnsbury resident. It's very powerful. And there was a, a similar, um, a similar study taking London, uh, where an academic, these are anthropologists and sociologists are looking at this, but uh, called Sensing the City. And these were people who were using their own individual enthusiasm and huge kind of uh, command of detail to give uh, people uh, a sense of the personality of the city that they want to talk about. And again, um, here with this uh, project, I think this enormous amount of detail makes this re very relevant. Um, and it allows this intimate exploration of an area uh, that you might only get, you know, there are guides uh, who, for example, have this kind of great connection with the River Fleet and they would walk it and, you know, the modern uh, built environment around the River Fleet would disappear and they would conjure up uh, the riverscape as it was uh, back through the centuries. And the detail that comes from this project, the work on this project, enables that. So how did we design this walk? And 
I always think it's quite helpful to think, can you describe in one sentence what the walk is about? And this we took from the project summary. It's, we want to have a vivid picture of life in early and mid-century Barnsley. And how do you achieve that? Um, and rather than listing separate areas, what I wanted to do with this diagram was show you how many things are interconnected when you're thinking about designing a walk. Um, and you've got these overlapping bubbles of the content, uh, the practicalities of the duration, and also the audience and the client. And I'm going to start off with, with those, in fact, because um, they're slightly, slightly different. Um, the client here was the Tales from the Crypt project. I took our one kind of one sentence strap line from their project summary. And uh, we were very aware that we wanted to do justice to the vision of the project, but also the hard work of all the volunteers. And one of the issues was that we couldn't obviously include all the volunteers, all that, uh, all the things that Susan talked about when you're preparing the, um, the exhibition come to us as well. You've got so much material. How do you make sense? How do you select the stories? And again, we used their themes uh, that, uh, that they identified and uh, tried to build around that. And so even though we only told a relatively limited number of stories, indirectly we were drawing on the other people that had been researched. And who was our audience? And we knew that it was going to be very local. Uh, local from uh, friends and family of the volunteers, local from residents in the area, local in that we were contacting schools and charity groups and through um, the uh, museum uh, trying to contact some of the hard to reach um, communities uh, where they would normally consume uh, this kind of heritage interpretation. Um, and the walk was a fantastic opportunity to connect those people because uh, we saw it very much as them learning about people who had lived in their area before them, enhancing the understanding of people who came before them. Duration. The walk, I mean, everyone has a different view about how long a walk should be. I've got colleagues who do very long walks, some people do all day walks. But in general, we think that uh, a walk should be about an hour and a half to two hours. And that's because between stops, you shouldn't spend any more than five minutes walking. Uh, get, that gets too long. And when you have stopped and someone is talking, you don't want to spend more than four or five minutes there uh, either. And we reckon that 10 or 12 stops, uh, points at which you, which you stop and talk is plenty. And so that gives you uh, quite a definition of where, where your walk is going to go, if you like. You can't walk that far and you have to uh, look at all the options that you've got uh, for when you're moving around your streetscape, as it was here. And finally, content. And I'm talking about kind of talked content, what people are listening to, but I want to start off with the visual content as well. One of the issues we had that there was no crypt. Um, we couldn't uh, we couldn't show anyone even where people got into the crypt. And uh, we pushed Rosie and Susan quite hard on this to start off with about whether we could have any images or how we could deal with that. But that was uh, we felt a weakness for us, and that we had to paint paint a picture through words of it. But what we did have was obviously a lot of the houses and streets, which is fantastic. But house after house, uh, we wanted to brand the wide variation. And so we thought about um, air, uh, buildings uh, in the area that we could also bring in, apart from the church, which is obviously a key part of the story. We've got the remnants of the Wild House, the outdoor relief office is relatively close, the London Fever Hospital moved, uh, to very close to uh, Clancy Square during this period when people were being buried there. So that was interesting for us and particularly picking up the theme of health. 
and there was also an infant school uh, that was built through the church, uh, which was visually uh, a lovely building, um, but also uh, brought in that side, that side, and another element to the story. And then we selected from the stories using these themes, trying to balance up age, sex, occupation. We were driven by these 178 uh, residents of the crypt and their stories, and we were using those as the platform. Um, and some of the stories, we just concentrated on the story themselves. It was so good, so it might be, for example, so fascinating. Um, and others, we very much put into the context of Islington or London at the time, infant mortality, health, uh, what were people dying of in Islington? How does that compare with what's in the crypt? So we, we tried to kind of move in and out. And we also tried to recognize where there were big and relevant stories of which one of them was plantation ownership and slave ownership from uh, a couple of families that had lived um, uh, nearby and were buried in the crypt. And so we tried to uh, look at those stories in the context of what was happening in England at the time um, with the abolition of slavery uh, movement, um, particularly between in the, in the 1820s. So that was how we tried to balance up our content. And we drew a number of maps of ourselves. Uh, again, Rosie and Susie might recognize some of these. On your left of your screen, you can see the walk that we came up with. And the green dots are the, um, the kind of visual interest points that weren't houses. Um, and uh, if you look uh, towards the kind of bottom third, you've got where the crypt is, Cloudsley Square. And we decided that we would very much try and walk around the area and it would be a circular walk. That's one of the decisions you've got to take. Are you going to make a circular walk or are you going to begin somewhere and end somewhere else? Both are perfectly valid, but because the crypt was driving this whole um, story that we were trying to tell, we chose to have a circular walk. The picture on the, the diagram on the right shows what we ended up with because of COVID. And I thought that would be interesting for you to see in terms of um, how we amended the walk and that it became much shorter. We visually lost the workhouse, which is at the top right in stock number eight. But what the black marks show is how we were able to incorporate those stories. And, and so uh, the workhouse story, we then linked to the individual, one of the individuals, George Ross, who lived um, here, if you can see that, in, uh, near Malvern Terrace. Uh, Stop Nine was the less than last story who were plantation owners in Demerara. We moved this here, and in fact, I think that became a richer story almost, because of, as the research developed, we got early research from Susan and her team, but all the time we were designing and developing the walk, they kept coming up with more information. And in fact, where we put this walk here uh, was illustrated by uh, one of the illustrations that Susan gave um, in her presentation of Thomas Morgan Fair, whose father had uh, died as a merchant mariner, died in Demerara, and the Lespinas family were Demerara plantation owners. So that was a, was a kind of very relevant way we were able to move that. And the fever hospital we, we did from a distance. And so that, that still worked, it was quite close, but for COVID reasons, we couldn't go onto this busy thoroughfare here. So I hope that's given you a kind of uh, in, uh, insight into how we became involved in the project and how we developed it. All walks are really individual, um, but you do have these parameters of your audience and the uh, duration, the kind of street streetscape that you're working with, and then in your content and, and how you can kind of mix up visual interest and interesting stories. And inevitably, you have to drop wonderful things as, as you go, and we found that. Uh, one of the things that we never managed to achieve because of COVID was we were just at the point of preparing the children's walk, which would have been quite different and picked up 
a different theme. So rather than the building of the squares, we, for example, we had thought that we would talk about building of the infrastructure and the building of the sewers. One of the sewers, one of the building issues that Rebecca discovered was where the sewer went right underneath the church. And children are always fascinated with what happens uh, with uh, what, what happens in the toilet. So that that was that was the way we were kind of trying to uh, to pick up that kind of interest uh, rather than talk about uh, vestry power politics we were going to talk about uh, families that were involved in smithfield and the meat market and cattle that went right down this road here liverpool road so there would have been quite a variation in how we would have tackled it for the children and sadly we never got to do that this uh limited walkway we have managed to Chief, I think it's we've managed to do eight out of the 12 walks, but sadly, instead of having about 20 people on the walk, which is what we would normally have, we've had to do them with six. But I've hugely enjoyed doing them, so thank you, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, hi, thanks, Susan. There is one question that I've just seen come through from Alina. Um, how did you market the tours? What sort of participants came on the tours? Did you develop a diverse or new audience and were the tours free? Okay, I'll take the uh, last first. The tours were free. They were funded by the project. Mm -hmm. Um, marketing went through a lot of local channels, so Islington Guided Walks, we promoted them on our website, through our Twitter, etc. We contacted um, Islington Life, which is the council, and uh, marketed it through their uh, uh, kind of what's on um, uh, kind of processes. And we also had started um, contacting the local schools. Um, and trying to uh, trying to access the local schools there, but as I said, we didn't get to develop that because um, COVID came in. Did we develop a diverse or new audience? I think that is really hard for us to tell because of the numbers being so limited, um, and because you know we were just I think we had just got the tours up on Eventbrite when, when we went into the first lockdown. Um, and when they went up again, uh, they sold out incredibly quickly. So, um, and partly that was because there was, has been so much kind of fantastic local work done around the project with local kind of residence groups um, that I think a lot of local people um, who had already heard about the project, hooked on it uh, very quickly. Not entirely, but I think it's very hard for us to judge that. Um, we had certainly had these plans for a diverse and new audience. So, for example, uh, contacting families through Bright Start, um, Islington Heritage work with groups like Bright Start and contacting families like that. We had planned for family walks as well. So would we have got a more diverse uh, audience? I don't know. We certainly had planned to do that. And I know that that was something that the project was very keen on. But uh, we absolutely did not achieve that um, because of the limited numbers um, uh, that happened. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, no, I'm just checking, making sure I can't see any waving hands. No. Um, okay, thanks, Susan. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Susan. It's been brilliant. Um, and uh, so now I'd just like to turn to our final speaker, Chris Wells, who has been a volunteer on the project, but is also um, our designer for the project. So that has helped us enormously with his knowledge of the project in terms of him inputting that into the design process. So um, I'd like Chris now to speak to you about um, the reflections of a volunteer. Afternoon, everyone. Hi. I'm just going to share my screen. Can someone let me know if you can see that? Yep, 
all good. Great. Fantastic. Okay, um, afternoon. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you all very much indeed for having me here today. Um, as Rosie said, my name is Chris Wells. I'm one of the volunteers from the project. Um, I've been asked to speak about a few things. Um, firstly, what was my experience of volunteering actually like? Um, how my wife and I became involved, because we, we both volunteered together on the project. What my three roles were, um, what the experience was like overall, um, and what benefits came out of it for me. Uh, anything I would have done differently with hindsight. And to finish off, I, I've got a few kind of top tips and recommendations for anyone who's currently thinking of developing a project a little bit like Tales from the Crypt from my individual volunteers point of view. Um, just a bit of background, my wife and I, um, Alison and I, we moved to Barnsbury where the project is kind of based in early 2015. So we've lived there for about five years or six years until about a month ago when we relocated here to Paris, um, where I currently am. Um, so while we were working on Tales from the Crypt, Alison was a civil servant and I'm, I was a design consultant. Um, and as, as a designer, I'm, I'm completely obsessed and really love old maps and old images of the area where we live. And so we had been interested in trying to learn a bit about the history of our local area for some time, but we'd never really known where to start. Um, so the tale we spent most of our time researching is the, uh, it's become a little bit infamous now on the, on the project. It's the tale of the two Rice sisters. And if there's any time at the end, I'll just relate a little bit about that as well. Um, but what was it like? Um, I've got to say, it's been one of the most brilliant things we've ever done um, together. We just thoroughly enjoyed ourselves and it's been really fascinating, but actually also actually got quite challenging um, and very time consuming. Um, the tale we began researching back now in, I think it was about September 2019, uh, became really quite all consuming for several months. Actually, we haven't even finished it yet, really. There's still more threads to follow up on. Um, but um, whenever I tell people about the experience that I had of, of, of working on the and, and being a volunteer researcher, I often tell them it, it's a, it felt a little bit like I was on holiday in my own neighborhood. Um, because I again began to see the surroundings that you normally take for granted when you walk around your local area with fresh eyes, a little bit like you do when you go on holiday to, to somewhere new you've never visited before. Um, and every time we discovered a new thread in our story, it felt like we'd uncovered a new secret which nobody had known about for hundreds of years. And our, our home actually started looking like those um, incident rooms in the in the in, in crime shows where they've got pictures all over the walls and threads joining them up. And it it became this incredible kind of uh, uh, detective story at times. We got quite addicted to it um, to the point where our some of the other volunteers on the on the, the um, project started making fun of us when we were on holiday. And we started excitedly sort of texting them and, and emailing them saying we discovered something new while we were on, on you know, Googling around of the story um, because it just became this, this all consuming passion for a couple of months. Um, the, 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 I suppose that to an aside to that, the, 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 one of the most important things for, I think for, for all of us is just that we've, we've felt a lot more connected with our local neighbors and people in our local community. Um, and, and many of them are now, we've now feel firm friends with them. I really miss them now when we've moved to Paris actually. Um, how did we originally get involved in the, in the project? Um, Alice and I were both busy professionals. She was a civil servant at the time um, and I was trying to run my own company. Uh, we volunteered a little bit before for a few local community projects, but neither of us were what you'd think of as regular volunteers. So we were literally just lucky. Uh, it was a complete coincidence to, to discover the project because Alison was, uh, you know, she'd occasionally go on Instagram and just look at the local area and photographs the local area. And, and fortunately, somebody had posted a, a, an image about the, the project and, and, and with information about how to discover more about it. So we, we followed up with that. If, if she hadn't been looking at Instagram, she almost, we almost certainly wouldn't have discovered it um, because we're not the, the usual sort of, you know, volunteers who keep keep in touch with what's going on in the local area. And we, we didn't subscribe to our local newspaper, which, you know, is where a lot of the promotion was going on. So the thing that attracted us to that, to the to, to the project, once we discovered it, was was to one to twofold, really. One was the opportunity to learn about our local area, because we were int intrigued by um, local history research and We've been to the local art history archive uh, once to, to just, we just sort of looked at local images of the, the area and, and been thought it was very interesting, but we weren't 
we weren't at all unsure about how to then continue and do real research. Um, and um, after kind of after after discovering the project, we popped along to Susan's open coffee morning at uh, a local church to see if it was something we might be interested in getting involved with. And, and Susan's energy and enthusiasm just, you know, she single handedly persuaded us to get involved. It was, it, you know, we were, we were sucked in from then on. <laughs> she lured us in. So once we'd been lured in by uh, Susan, what were my roles? I, I actually ended up taking on three roles in, in the project. The first is uh, it was the local history research itself. Um, and um, that, that intrigued us alone, but I personally was also interested in, in the, the, the outputs and the, the outcomes of the project and what the final product would look like. Because as a designer, I was thinking very on early on about, you know, how, 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 what, would, what could we create out of this? So I also then volunteered to be an exhibition curator to help uh, shape and plan and write the exhibition itself and the pub and public engagement activities because public engagement really intrigues me. And I also ended up then joining the project team themselves in the end in my professional capacity as a graphic designer um, to produce those exhibition panels and the promotional materials. So uh, back to back to just the, the, the archival research. Uh, this is us in our, our first archive training session at the Islington Archive, which is wonderful. That's me in the middle obsessing over old maps. The training course was, it was one of the main reasons that I wanted, certainly wanted to get involved in the project. And the team at the Islington Archive were fantastic. They were really great, just in-depth training on the resources available in the archive, how to understand that, how they, the resources fit into a wider context and practical advice on how to undertake the research itself. Um, uh, we, Alison and I, as, as a couple, we went on to then visit the archives independently and the library on our own many times, as well as uh, other, other places like the London Metropolitan Archives uh, to study the rate books and the directories and the early census records and, and obviously maps, because uh, I'm obsessed with maps, uh, to find out information on the individuals we were researching. Um, we were also really lucky to be able to tour the, the Holy Trinity, as it's now known as the, Cl the Cloudsy Center, um, because it was inaccessible to the public. And we hadn't been able to access records about the actual contents of the, the church and what was in there. And so we didn't know that hidden inside would be a major clue to our own tale. Um, as you can see on this photograph, um, the, the just moments before it was taken, we just discovered the, the stone inscription that's behind my head. That's a memorial to the, the two sisters that we were researching in our tale. And so for us, that was one of the most exciting moments in our, in our, in our story, because it was the first physical confirmation uh, that, you know, these, these sisters existed. They really were buried in, in the crypt. You know, they had lived in the area. It was a, a quite a, a moving moment. Um, and it really linked our research and what we'd been discovering into the, into the physical fabric of the church. Um, once, our, once the bulk of our research was complete, I then, as I said, had a chance to volunteer as an exhibition curator, which was in many ways a, a, a larger and more directly valuable opportunity for me to learn skills which directly benefited, benefited me professionally. Um, an exhibition curation and public engagement is an area I really want to, to get involved in more. Um, and then as a consultant graphic designer, as I said, I joined the project team itself. And you can see here that photograph is of the plaque we were, I was stood by in the church, so I got to actually design the exhibition graphics, as well as all the print and online materials to promote the exhibition and the public engagement activities. And that's my photograph in the pla in in the exhibition panel, which you can see in this photograph of the exhibition when it was when it was um, mounted in the in the in the museum in the in the archive, um, which felt like a real. Um, continuity or, or, or felt like, a, like I was involved through all the stages of the, the project, which is new for me. Normally as a graphic designer, I'm brought in quite late on in, the, in, in a project's development. And it was a really wonderful experience to be able to first find the information and do the research, then synthesize it into, a, in, into an exhibition and then design the exhibition. It gave me a much better understanding of the whole process from start to finish. It was a, a really wonderful uh, thing to be involved with. Um, and I actually, I, I, after the, the exhibition moved to the, the new space in the Clousey Centre, I, I really liked the way that it was, it, it became a much more, I mean, it's obviously in a building site, but that it, it has a, 
a grittiness and a reality to it that I think is it brings all of these stories into the space that they actually relate to. I really like that fact. Um, so the benefits for me, what I got out of it? Professionally, um, as I said, um, I got to combine the findings from our own research with my professional skills, especially in areas like map making and exhibition design and public engagement design. I, I, I obviously really benefited from that. Uh, and the training I received in exhibition curation and, and archival research uh, is gonna be useful on many other projects as I go forward in my professional life. But personally, uh, I think the, the, the benefits were much bigger. It was, it, it was wonderful to create the exhibition, but we found the final walking tour that Alison and I wrote, uh, uh, that, which you can see in the photograph above with some of the other volunteers. I think it was, I think that for us personally was the most rewarding part of the whole project. We got to, we got to convert or transform our, our raw research into a story, into the tale of these two sisters and to walk the very same paths you know, each of those characters from the tales would have taken along with the other volunteers and their tales. Uh, I, I think, you know, that that was incredibly moving for us all. And certainly we we really appreciated that. Uh, I think that's some, one thing I would definitely recommend everybody who's thinking about uh, create, you know, creating one of these projects themselves also tries to achieve. Um, so I have to also just mention Susan, who, uh, Susan Scared has, she's, she's just been the most brilliant um, volunteer coordinator. And uh, she's got this kind of brilliant combination of a really deep technical understanding of historical research, but then also the ability to uh, transform those findings in, into wonderful stories. Uh, and I think that, that without her, I think this wouldn't have gone, in, you know, in, in nearly as successful. In, in nearly as successful. Um, there was one particular moment we remember um, when we were in the archive together with with Susan and she just happened to mention the deceased wife's sisters act which is a key part of our story and um, it just sent us off on this completely new tangent and, and and gave us a completely new perspective on the whole story and it was um it's just an example of how you know without her I think we wouldn't have been able to do what we did so uh what would I do differently if I was given the chance to start the project again uh, from scratch with 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 the, with the experience of having done it? Uh, I would say uh, from day one, I wish I'd tried to get the other volunteers together more informally to share our discoveries and the research methods and the, the tips and tricks that we'd learned, uh, as well as the resources we'd discovered. Because uh, we probably spent the first four four or six weeks not really talking to any of the other volunteers. Uh, you know, we were just doing our own research, and it left us feeling a bit lost. Lost. Whereas by the end of the project, we were meeting them down the pub every fortnight and swapping the latest discoveries in our tales. And just, it was like gossip, you know, it was like it was discuss, it was like discussing the latest, you know, TV series you, you, you've got hooked on. Um, and it, it became really addictive. And, and that really built our energy and built our, our, our excitement about the project. Um, we did actually early on have a little go at trying to identify themes and our, interpret our own research findings into a, some sort of wider context. And I wish we'd continued those discussions further, um, but spending more time together with the other volunteers to try and identify the key themes, uh, it, it, that might've helped. Uh, equally, I wish we'd gone on more group trips to the archives with some of the other volunteers, because it's, it's only now that we've lived through COVID and had to move to Paris, um, that we've really come to understand how valuable all those archives and those assets are and those, those resources. And if we can't get into them, there's, it, it becomes impossible to use them. Um, and I also wish I'd set up a website for the project because uh, as a designer, I could have done that. And I, I, you know, I think that would have been incredibly useful just to get, have a sort of central shared resource where we could have um, put all of the, 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 the findings we were discovering. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, I, these are my these are my this is my perspective as an individual volunteer. I mean, I wasn't involved in the planning of the project, so just from an, a volunteer's point of view, um, if 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 somebody asked me what what I would say would have helped me as a as a volunteer, you know, to, you know, organising a project like this, um, going what. Going back to what I said about Susan and the other volunteers' energy, I would say try to find as many ways as possible to make it fun for the volunteers and about human contact. 
to the best of your ability, obviously during COVID. But the fun was the fun was really important because we we spent, as I said, so many wonderful evenings in the pub, just gossiping shamelessly about all the scandals, and the highs and lows, and the intrigue, and the rags to riches stories, or or riches to rags stories, of the people who literally lived in the houses, you know, and the neighbourhood we live in, uh, but two hundred years earlier, because um, I think that that really built the energy uh, for, the, for the volunteers and we all, always went away from those you know evenings just feeling really excited about the project um, but I think crucially early on it took some of us um, a lot of time before we felt like we got the project and understood what we were meant to be doing we noticed we, so that that's how we felt and we weren't the only ones we noticed other people felt the same way some volunteers seemed very comfortable with ambiguity and, and uncertainty and they just went ahead and, and got, got cracking. And others of us felt like we needed a, a clear description or a brief or some sense of what direction we should be going in. Um, so I'd say if, if you can try to cater to both types of people uh, and arrange technical and research uh, training early on after the volunteers are just brought on board so that it avoids that frustration and that slight confusion at the beginning. Um, and also to sort of try to identify or, or define a clear sense of what the outcomes might look like so that the, those volunteers who are uncomfortable with ambiguity can see a vision for what they're working towards or what they're doing it for or what will come out of it. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I, I think give plenty of opportunities for researchers to try and compare their notes or ask one another for support. Um, some people are very comfortable with using technology and, and, and websites and and others feel a lot less comfortable. And that that actually doesn't map to age. I, I was, you know, surprised at some of the some of the sort of um, uh, people in the volunteers who were older felt very comfortable with technology, whereas some of the younger ones didn't. So it was it, it was it was a, a really interesting experience for me. Um, and perhaps identify those who are specialists in technology or who have some experience and 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 see if they can help you set up your systems. <clears throat> Uh, consider reaching out to unusual suspects. I think Susan said this in one of the first workshops. Um, Alice and I would probably have never been, we would never have known about this uh, this project if it weren't for the, just the, somebody posting it on Instagram. But consider unusual channels and attracting different types of volunteers that you may never may never ordinarily come into contact with. Um, similarly, nurture people who might already have got some way towards doing what you're trying to do anyway. Because um, I think there, were, I think there were people like um, Jenny who spoke earlier and Nick Collin who had already been doing similar research, but in a personal capacity for years. They were absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, Susan, so I, I, I popped around to Susan's house and helped her set up a, a, a PC, um, and she transcribed several very long and very difficult to read manuscripts for us, and it was just wonderful how we collaborated on that. Um, and I think. It's, as Susan, I think again, Susan mentioned in the first workshop presentation um, a few weeks ago that um, we just ended up feeling like we know our neighbours now. And it's been just during COVID has been really reassuring to feel like a, 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 a more integrated member of the community. So where next? For me, um, I feel much more confident and empowered to go out and actually undertake my own research now. I'm um, hoping that other volunteers are interested in continuing the work that we started as well. Just to give one example, I watched a talk by Giles Darks, who's from the Historic Towns Trust, and he recently designed this map of uh, Tudor London for Layers of London. And because my my passion, I still have this passion for old maps, uh, and, and I want to understand how Barnsbury developed. So the work we've done on the Tales from the Crypt projects inspired me to think about trying to map, plot a map of the area's early development over time, just building on what I did for the, the exhibition graphics uh, because it seems to attract a lot of attention and interest this this map of the area and how it developed so that's that's personally i'm i'm in, i'm intrigued by the possibility of doing that so that's just to give an example of how i think that what this project has done has given me a sense that i could go away and do that i know how to do it i know where i'd go and look and find the resources that i need and it, it's it's shown me that there's interest and and an engagement in the local area and in, in someone taking that work on and trying to do it um, as well as other things like building a database of the findings that we've all uncovered. Um, so I think there are, there are loads of ways that this work could then could carry on in future as well. I'm really excited by that. Um, 
So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you for staying <laughs> till the end. Um, and I hope some of the information in this was useful to you. But if you do have any other questions, feel, uh, either feel free to ask them in the, uh, now or um, follow up later via my email. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, we just have one question so far, which is uh, from Kay saying, I love your enthusiasms and lessons drawn. Please let us have a flavour of your research story. So what actually happened to the sisters? Oh, there's demand. Brian also says the same. Tell us about the sisters. Oh, God. OK, this is I wasn't prepared for this. OK. Um, <laughs> On the spot. Well, okay, so, <clears throat> so what I mean, Susan did a brilliant job of describing this story um, in the, one of the last workshops I watched. Uh, so actually, fr from the from the point of view of a volunteer, this was really interesting. What happened was um, Susan circulated the burial records for everyone who's buried in there, all the individuals buried in the crypt. <clears throat> and we were looking through the list and each of us got two sheets to tra transcribe into into, you know, into text because it's very hard to read the script. And I noticed in both of our pages, there were two two women living at the same address, three Morven Terrace. Uh, with the same surname and I thought oh they must maybe they were sisters living with a you know a living with a, either just together or with a with one of them had married and uh, and they you know they maybe they or, or it got it was very confusing <clears throat> it turned out they both both were sisters in fact but they had both married the same man uh, so I mean I, I, I could I could tell you this story and it could it would take an hour to relate it um, properly but basically they're um, both sisters were born into quite considerable wealth uh, in uh, <clears throat> um, central England somewhere. I forget now. It's been a while since we looked at the story uh, and moved to Swansea where their uh, father then passed away and left them all of their wealth along with a third sister. Um, so there were basically three sisters who inherited a, a lot of wealth and quite a lot of land and titles in the uh, town of Northleach, which is in Gloucestershire. Um, and they somehow, we believe they met um, a man who was acting as their father's solicitor's clerk uh, by the name of Jevon Harper. So I should say that the, the sister's names were uh, Theodosia Rice and her elder sister was Henrietta Rice. Uh, and both of them were somewhat older than Jevon Harper, but he eventually married Henrietta, the elder sister, uh, while he was living in Three Morven Terrace, which is in Barnsbury, this, this area we've been researching. Uh, about a year and a half, two years later, Henrietta passed away, but it turns out that Theodosia was already living with them. So th both sisters were living with Henrietta's husband. And uh, a matter of weeks after Henrietta's death and burial at the church, uh, Theodosia, the younger sister, made out her will to Jevon uh, and then um, married him about three months later. And the intriguing part that I mentioned that Susan put us on to was the fact that um, at the time, government, uh, probably only a year earlier, government had made it illegal to marry the deceased, the, the sister of your deceased wife. And that's because at the time it was believed that um, once you'd married a woman, she became, it was co-sanguinity. It was, you, they, you, were, you shared the, the same blood effectively. So it was seen as incestuous. So they had to flee to Edinburgh um, and marry in secret uh, in Edinburgh uh, where it was legal still. And then re they returned to live in Malvern Terrace. And only another year, year and a half, two years later, Theodosia herself passed away. So he'd married both sisters within the space of uh, a matter of years. Um, at which point a lot of people start saying, oh, that sounds a bit um, strange. What, what's going on there? And then it turns out that uh, he then purchased this the final third of the inheritance from the third, well, from the husband of the third sister who had also recently died and then became the Lord of Northleach, which entitled him to vote and, and gave, granted him, uh, uh, so get granted him voting rights and he also inherited quite a lot of land and we assume quite a lot of wealth from, 
from that inheritance. And the 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 uh, the will, Theodosia's will, was contested in the ecclesiastical courts, the high, highest ecclesiastical courts at the time, the Court of Arches, uh, which caused quite a, a, a controversy at the time. And there became that, that it was discussed in Parliament and um, uh, that we are still trying to hunt down the documents relating to that. Sorry, I'm talking for a very long time, but it's, you can tell it's quite an, a compelling tale <clears throat> and it's obsessed us for quite a, quite a few months now. So thank you, sorry. <clears throat> I think that's all of it. Susan, have I got all of that? Or was there more? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I'm losing my voice now. <laughs> no, well, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and yes, obviously, the chance to investigate more and further is, you know, would be a fantastic opportunity to tie in with the next stages of the project. So, you know, we're very much looking forward to hopefully being able to do that again. Mm. Um, so thank you everybody very much uh, who has uh, taken part and given presentations and thank you also to everybody for attending. Um, I hope you found that interesting and uh, we have actually despite starting late managed to finish just a little bit early so that's probably um, a good thing because um, I'm conscious that obviously on Zoom it, it can all get a little bit tiring. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, Becky will uh give you the link to the slides presentations and the recording and as i said if you've got any further questions please just do um email becky and she'll pass them on to the individual speakers so um thank you very much for coming and uh, useful <laughs>